Good morning. Today I want to talk about two first ladies. I had, had originally thought maybe skipping over them, but I just can't quite bring myself to do it. But today I want to talk about Eliza Johnson and Julia Grant, two very different women who had the good fortune to succeed Mary Lincoln. I, uh, I think that probably did more for them and their personalities than anything else. And, um, and to me, that's very, very sad. I think almost any woman in the role of First Lady would have enjoyed a warm reception after Mrs. Lincoln's departure. After leaving uh, D.C., our Mary became almost a caricature and uh, a reminder of sad and terrible times. And like I said to you in the last lecture, uh, she, I think all, the, all of the sympathy and concern went on Robert rather than Mary and part of that was due to her difficulty but I think a large part of that was due to her southernness so uh, I hope I hope you've reached a conclusion about Mary there's you know if I'm not careful I'll have a whole nother lecture on her here but I hope you've reached a conclusion about Mary and I hope that you see some of the positive things about both her and her marriage Today, we want to start with Eliza McArdle Johnson. She was born on October 4th, 1810 in Leesburg, Tennessee. Her parents were John and Sarah McArdle, and she will marry Andrew Johnson on May 17th, 1827. Andrew Johnson is one of the most interesting presidents, and I think one who, like others we've seen, is an architect of some of his own difficulties. But he was also underestimated. Um, I don't want to get into too much of a, a historical discussion here about the politics of the day because you've had all of that in your other courses. But with Lincoln's death, it's the radical Republicans, you know, held the keys to the asylum. And I, I, I tend to look at them as uh, some of my least favorite of all the political bodies in American history. We all understand that the nation had to be reunited. We understood that the South, you know, carried the war blame, but um, they made it as punitive and as harsh and as, I think, um, let me think of the word, exploitative of freed slaves, giving them empty promises and really fulfilling none of them. Uh, for their own political expediency. And I see some of that in today, uh, not within radical Republicans, but within other groups where certain factions of our culture are given empty promises in return for votes. So in the midst of this, Andrew Johnson was a unique character. He was a Southerner, a Tennessean, yet he was a Unionist and was brought on the ticket uh, to help Lincoln in 1864 to help Lincoln um, bridge that gap, bring you know, hopefully keeping Tennessee squarely more in the Union. Uh, I think Dr. Justice is always quick to tell you the last to secede and the first to reconstruct. And Johnson is a unique character. Uh, let me just say this very quickly. When I was in graduate school, there was a couple of different studies about presidents and different presidential types. and there were comparisons made between Andrew Johnson and Lyndon Johnson that were quite appropriate. Um, there's also an area of history called psychohistory, which is not quite what it sounds like, but it's you try to understand how the mind of a great leader works to, to help see the impact of their unique psychology as has on the, the, the historical timeline. And, uh, you know, Johnson is certainly an interesting one to study. Grew up very humble, very poor, always in sort of the poor white category of Southern culture. And it left its mark on him, it left its scar. But, and he didn't, and here's where you'll see a little controversy. It's very frequently said that Johnson's wife, um, our beloved Eliza, taught him to read. That may very well, in fact, be so, other sources will say that she improved upon his very almost non-existent reading skills. But in any case, she educated him and, and, and assisted him in a way that would help him build his political career. 
in which he did. He became a fiery, if not unpolished, um, but very interesting stump speaker and will work his way up into politics um, through the congressional route and ultimately on the ticket with Johnson, or excuse me, with Lincoln in 1864, as we said. A few things about her I want to tell you. Um, she is one of my favorites. She is one of my favorites. By all accounts, I believe that she was a true helpmeet and that they had a successful marriage. They had children, Martha, the oldest, Charles, Mary, Robert, Andrew Jr., and Frank. Um, they, I believe, were a very well-bonded family. I want to be careful how I say that. Uh, she will rely on her daughters to assist her with with her uh, duties in the White House. And let's talk a little bit about that, about what's going to happen when she arrives. I believe she was very patient with Mary getting out, and that's important. Um, I appreciate that out of Mrs. Johnson, very patient with Mary getting out. And she herself, Eliza, was a small, frail woman. Your textbook author, uh, Crowley, will tell you that you know, she used that physicality to her advantage, and I want to explain that carefully. She understood the cruelty of the Washington press and the intrusiveness of the press, and she did not want that to be a battle that she is going to fight. So she, when she goes into the White House, you know, as First Lady for the first time, uh, she makes the most of this. She had very gray white hair. She had dealt with tuberculosis. And she added to this very frail, withdrawn uh, physical appearance. She, she wore a shawl and, and always sort of kept herself in a very diminutive position. Uh, she, and this is, I believe, a portion, this, a mention of this in your textbook. When she's going up the stairs into the presidential uh, quarters with the press behind her um, and they were trying to ask questions, she said, my dears, I am an invalid. And the message was very clear. As Caroli says, uh, it was just let me be because I am not going to give you anything to write about. I'm not very exciting. Don't look for dances and socials and all kind of restoration of grand social life here because it's not going to happen. She had a sunny room in the White House uh, family quarters where she would sit and she would manage the White House affairs as effectively as any First Lady we've ever had. She would oversee menus, oversee hiring, oversee um, any kind of uh, work that needed to be done within the White House. She, she would make the call and, and dictate what had to be done. But she was always first and foremost there to be accessible to her husband. And she had the perfect physical appearance uh, to keep herself from being distracted. She's going to have this little, fragile, older woman who is going to be um, our first lady. And she could, she could hide behind that and do what she really was wanting, wanting to do, which was take care of her husband. She was singularly devoted to his physical and emotional comfort. Um, she would always make sure that his upstairs living quarters were clean and comfortable, very tidy. She, she did some of that herself within the limits of, of her, her um, physical abilities. She would, I believe, as I mentioned to you in an earlier lecture, she would look at the newspapers first thing in the morning before he did, and she would cut out articles for him, the ones that she wanted him to read, and she would also cut out and destroy those articles she worried about making him uh, very angry or upset. So she was always looking out for him. And there's so much more to be said about her. I want you to know that when Johnson came into the presidency, the radicals in both the House and the Senate believed that he would be an easily manipulated puppet um, who would be a lot easier to get their way with than they had with Lincoln. And they found out that quite the opposite was true. He stood up. Uh, he was, let me say this about Johnson, because he is a wonderful lecture unto himself, as I'm sure you've enjoyed with Dr. Justice. But he was someone who was informally educated compared to many 
but he knew the Constitution, and as a matter of fact, was buried with a copy of the Constitution. And he knew that much of the legislation that was being passed by these radicals was unconstitutional. And he believed that the Supreme Court would support him in that. Now, you and I may have a, a chance to talk about this in constitutional history next semester, uh, but this, the radicals, it's like we were being, Carrington, it's like we were being governed by um, one branch of the government, the radicals within the House and the Senate. So the Congress was really running the country, and they did whatever they wanted to do, and they passed laws that were unconstitutional on their face, uh, the Tenure of Office Act, uh, several of these, and he ignored them, and he thought that the Supreme Court would come to his victory, to his defense. But what he failed to realize, or to, to deal with squarely, was the fact that these radicals had, uh, and I'm telling you this, had threatened the Supreme Court by saying, you know, if you keep striking down our legislation, and this is this is a shout out to Tawny and his successors, if you uh, keep striking down our legislation, then we'll hit you where you live. We have the constitutional authority to limit the number of justices on the court to, to augment it or to limit it, and we will do so as it benefits our getting what we need done done. And that's a very frightening that is a very frightening threat. We saw the same thing happen with FDR and his court packing crisis, and we have seen that threatened again by President Biden. Now, only Congress has the right constitutionally to set the number of justices, but they do have the authority to do so. And I think um, this sort of, you know, cowed the court, and they would not run to Johnson's defense. And as a result, he's going to find himself in something that's very familiar to us today, impeached. And he will be, he will escape being removed from office. But after that, his own views and his own uh, disagreements with Congress are going to be stifled entirely. He's, he goes back down into, um, you know, the quarters and in, in the White House and is is a non-entity as they pursue their their policy that helped wreck the nation just about as much as the war had. Johnson will enjoy a, he will be re-elected after his presidency, which he's not re-elected. He will be elected to the U.S. Senate representing the state of Tennessee. And so like John Quincy Adams, he has a way to his last breath of serving the nation. And his and, and Eliza, I'm sure, makes that possible. Um, she dies one year after he does. And I, my hope is that they are both uh, with the Lord. And I'm glad we have the freedom to say that. I have every, every belief that um, they were. So she is a wonderful person for you to explore. And I hope that you have enjoyed looking at her if you've already done um, anything with her. And I want to, to go next to Julia Dent. I usually don't do two in a, a, a lesson, but I'm going to go ahead and do Julia Dent. This is really quick, and I um, apologize for that, but I enjoy her as well. She's, a, she's, as we say in our family, a hoot. But the election of, the election of, um, I'm so sorry, the election of, 1868, you know, brings a great war hero to the presidency. And I think that the two of them had had a tremendously successful marriage. Like Eliza, Julia believed in her husband when other people didn't typically. So let's start our look at Julia Dent Grant. And we'll move through this again pretty quickly, but then we'll be prepared for our next lecture on Lucy Hayes. Julia was born on January 26, 1826, in Missouri, and she's going to marry Ulysses S. Grant in 1822. Now, uh, neither parent approved this marriage. Her family were slave owners, which is interesting, isn't it? Missouri was a, um, a I, don't, I guess, a border state, um, but they were a state that was split. Uh, uh, wanting to secede and being kept in. Um, they were a state that was at odds. It was 
I'm sure you remember from American history that Missouri was much a microcosm of the Civil War within itself. Um, but what's interesting to me is Mrs. Grant, her family's background was forgiven her uh, much more than Mary's ever was. So that's a, that would be an interesting research paper, I think, to look at is why. I hope you could follow my, my chain of thought there. All right, let's look back here for a minute and, and talk a little bit about the Grants. Ulysses Grant was someone whose only real successes in life were his family and his military work. He is one of those who was really cut out for nothing other than serving in the military. His business enterprises, his other endeavors were miserable failures. And here in, in these times, uh, failure between wars, between uh, different assignments within the military. His drinking was terrible. It was a way to deal with the depression he had in being a failure in life or how he perceived himself. And she stood by him through all of this. And in fact, I think they stood by each other. Uh, he is the nation's hero, as you all know, as you know, he is the nation's hero after the Civil War. And he is a natural for uh, the presidency after, you know, the death of Lincoln and the very difficult years of Andrew Johnson. But I want you to understand, and you probably remember this from your class, Grant has, is not a political person. He does not think like that. He surrounds himself with people that seem nice and affable to him. And nine times out of ten, they were as rotten as the worst apple that's fallen off the tree could be. They are terrible. And he has so many scandals within his administration. He's reelected. He has two full terms. And it's just one thing after the other. They take terrible tolls on both our, our nation trying to recover and our nation's finances, which are trying to recover as well in this war. But I do not believe that Grant was himself personally um, corrupt. He just surrounded himself. He didn't know any better with people who, who were awful. And I'm sure you remember a lot of these uh, scandals in your discussions in American history. But a little bit about Julia. If Grant wasn't so much cut out to be president of the United States, there was no one more cut out to be first lady than Julia in some in some important ways. She did not have, you know, the grooming for the position that Harriet Lane had, but she had an enthusiasm for the position, just ultra patriotism. She wanted to be the first lady of this house, and she she was marvelous in her entertaining and just the way she she. Uh, took the White House by storm. She she would tell you, were she here with us? And I think she was a very positive, sunny, I kind of think a yellow person. She loved yellow and she had a very sunny, uh, yellow disposition, if you will. And she would tell you that all the times in her life had great moments of happiness, but that when she was the very happiest was when she was in the White House. She called it a feast of cleverness and wit. And she refurbished the White House inside and out. She got new furniture and chandeliers, all to bring it out of the darkness and sadness of the war years and into a new age. And these are not my words. These are words that I took from a secondary source. An age of optimism and prestige. I think that's beautiful. Optimism and prestige. She made the White House staff, and again, this is material that I have gotten from a secondary source, uh, much more formalized. All of them were um, uh, um, sort of military-esque uniforms, and it was, it was all to give some, some gallantry to the White House and some dignity to it. It wasn't just a dark place where Abigail Adams hung her laundry. It was the nation's the nation's home. It was the home of the president, and it should reflect the dignity of that office. I don't necessarily see her as um, a 
a snob, but she really enjoyed the position. She bought beautiful gowns with her own money, and by all accounts, she was as extravagant as Mary Lincoln. And again, it comes into comparison and contrast. Um, did people just fall down on Mary because she was perceived to be so difficult and so hysterical? Grant wanted a third term after the war, but because of all of the scandals, he really had to leave. He was another one that was enjoying the position in many ways. And it was devastating to Julia to left. And they, to ease this sort of, to ease her out, um, he will take them on this grand tour, this world tour. They're going to go to the Holy Land, the Mediterranean, uh, and the Orient, including India, China, and Japan, all these great ports of call. And I don't know of any other president at that time who had traveled as much. Even John Quincy and all of his, um, John Quincy Adams and all of his diplomatic assignments. Uh, he, I don't think it took him to the four corners the way this, this tour did. Sadly, at the end of his life, President Grant is going to find himself in terrible financial straits. He was never good with money, and then, as a matter of fact, um, that was often a source of great depression for him, that he couldn't handle his money. And I'm sure that the spending of Julia didn't help either. So Mark Twain, who had heard about uh, his poverty, offered to pay Grant to write his memoirs. And as you may know, there's something else that's going on here. He's not only impoverished or facing impoverishment, but he has, after many years of alcohol and uh, cigars, he is dealing with throat cancer. And he was told that it was terminal. And through great personal pain, he will write these right and in some instances have to dictate these memoirs so that his family had a source of income after his death. And to me, that says so much about Grant. I always see him as, is, as this general on the field for Lincoln waging a war of attrition against the Southern, Southern Army, the Southern military, and then the, the um, defeat of, of Lee. Um, as Southerners, you know, we, we don't always see Grant as the good guy, but I believe that he was, and that's another discussion. Um, I'm always afraid of my views being misinterpreted. Uh, I will say again, slavery was wrong, uh, but I have a love for the Southern culture, and whatever it took to rid our nation of something that was immoral, um, I would say was justified. Uh, there are other great sources of immorality in our culture today that I hope we can address without a major war. But having said all that, Grant, for all of his issues, uh, his problems with alcohol, um, his inability to, to run the government effectively. He was a wonderful family man. And he will die just days after um, his autobiography, or his memoirs rather, are published. They're lengthy, they're detailed, they're well written, and they're considered among the best of our, our autobiographical collections that we have. So. And he will pass away. He'll leave this earth in 1885. And Julia will leave in 1902. So I hope that's given you a little bit of information about these two wonderful ladies. I believe both were singularly dedicated to their husbands. And both probably helped them to achieve something great in life that would have been more difficult had they been on their own. Or had they been with women who were more self-seeking. When we come back, we'll talk about, um, if you get a chance, take a gander at some notes on the election of 1876. It was a mess. And I was reminded in 2000, the election of 2000, about how um, 
you know, it it was just very similar, and we had no idea what was going to, what how things were going to play out. But the election of 1876 is a mess, and it will be settled with the uh, selection of Rutherford B. Hayes as president of the United States. And unfortunately, he's sometimes referred to as his fraudulency, and I think that was absolutely no fault of his own. He was a good and moral man who had a wife cut of just sterling character, sterling character, Lucy Webb Hayes. So I look forward to talking about her in our next lecture, and thank you so much for your attention. In this